was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your experience in the early days with the Experimental Psychology Society. Yeah, yes, this is very interesting, isn't it? It's, I think it's extremely complex, and I doubt whether anyone can unravel all the ins and outs. Um, now, because um, I, 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 I noted it in one of the accounts of the society, I expect it was John Mullen who's written about the, um, uh, very knowledgeably about the early stages of the a group and then the society. But he sees Zangwill as playing some kind of r role in linking with other parts of psychology. But I, I don't think he was so foremost in that. Uh, I've been out, by the time I joined the society, there, there was this kind of hostility between uh, the experimentalists, in quotes, um, and uh, those people who, like Isink, who were making use of um, factor analysis. Now, um, the society, as a group, rather, it is, does, um, that they clearly intended to join up with those because um, Isink was uh, invited into the society, into the group quite early, I think. But he, he left, uh, ostensibly it was said, because um, uh, he thought it was too Cambridge-centred. Uh, and I don't know all the ins and outs of this. Um, and um, uh, uh, Isaac himself regarded Broadbent as a friend, so he was not, you know, so it, it, was, it was a... There, there were complications. I'm not able to talk in, uh, knowledgeably about any of the things, but one was aware of these. But there, 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 is, there were other factors which I hadn't quite understood. Um, now, I, I, I think probably somebody, maybe, maybe well has, uh, has done, I don't know, considered what was happening pre-war and what happened during the war. Because, after all, it was a, 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 a tremendous blow to psychology from some points of view uh, in the war coming and interrupting a sort of slowly developing subject. Um, as I say, at, at, uh, at UC, psychology had been there since the beginning of the century and, gro and growing up. Um, and... Uh, it, it's not true to say that that was dominated by factor analysis because it really wasn't. I mean, even in my period of degree in the 50s, um, you really didn't have to do uh, any factor analysis. Um, and quite a lot of experimental work of considerable interest was done there on, on many, many subjects. Um, uh, including uh, after effects, um, movement after effects and so on, you'll find quite a lot of work there. So, so there was, and I don't know about the rest of the country I, 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 what developments, but obviously um, there were special specialists in different branches of experimental psychology popping up here and there, and in animal work as well. But uh, one... In a, in, a, in a way, there, there could be a, a good argument why it was almost inevitable that there would be a Cambridge focus at the beginning of the work because of the uh, Bartlett's group, um, which had been doing very good uh, applied work and, and giving psychology uh, some kind of prominence in the thought of um, powers that be, I think. And also... Another thing is that the, uh, in, in Cambridge, where you're taking, where you have a tripos, uh, you don't essentially have the problem of recruiting psychology students. Uh, they can find out that way, which, uh, as I indicated for myself, that uh, um, one didn't know about psychology. Um, a levels were not even thought of at that time, so. Uh, uh, maybe that that was a point, but I, uh, I've always got a bit puzzled about uh, the position of the chap who succeeded 
uh, Roger Russell. Uh, I should say that Roger Russell was doing work, and you'll see in the um, uh, in various uh, parts of the uh, Quarterly Journal uh, that there are papers by Russell and others in there. So that was coming into the field, and also Russell had formed a, a, when he came to be a professor. That would be that must have been fifty seven, I think. Yes. No, that's well, Drew must have come in fifty-seven, but um, no, I'm getting mixed up here. Uh, talking about Roger Russell first, he had established uh, a little um, um, a group for the experimental analysis of behaviour. He said it was largely an animal group, and that's what when I finished my PhD, that's what where I had my first job. Uh, that's where I was doing work on animal learning, um, because my my thesis was in uh, stochastic models of learning. Um, so there were these uh, interactions building up, I, I think. Uh, and of course, uh, most people would say, and, and John Mollum would, model would be essentially of, of this group of people who had worked together at Cambridge, really wanting to hang in and stay together and keep in contact. And uh, um, but I, um, the person who was second uh, president was George Drew, and George Drew uh, succeeded Roger Russell as as head of, of, of uh, uh, UC. Uh, Drew had previously gone to be head of department at Bristol. Now I think that Drew uh, was, in some sense. Um, in greater contact with psychology uh, at large um, than uh, Oliver Zangwill was. Um, um, I think, uh, I'm not quite sure of all the work that he did when he was at Cambridge with Bartlett, but I think, uh, amongst other things, they, they, they did the um, uh, some of the cockpit research with Russell, Russell Davis. Um, but then he went to Bristol. But he had, he, uh, um, um, both Drew and Grindley, for example, another sort of seminal figure of the time, had also done animal work. I, I think, I think Drew had been with Lashley and Beach in America at some point. Uh, when, when, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, Drew, Drew was the um, uh, second uh, president of the group, or head of the group, or whatever the title was. Um, and uh, Drew ha had continued to do quite a lot of work in terms of working with uh, uh, DSIR, which was the forerunner of the SRC which is the forerunner of the SERC. And so he, he had built up quite a lot of um, contacts, I think, in, in, in building up psychology. The other thing was, uh, somehow or other, um, the British Psychological Society um, did become somewhat London-centric. Um, I'm not quite sure what drove it in that direction. But, of course, they were dealing, uh, the BPS was, uh, was concerned with um, uh, various branches of professional psychology. And in London, of course, I've mentioned you've got the um, uh, educational diploma, and uh, at, at the Morsley you had the, the clinical diploma. So there was that professional element in London, which is quite important. And also, of course, uh, at Birkwick College, um, there was um, uh, Alec Roger in occupational psychology. So I suppose London, inevitably, there were more general psychology people in there. And I, I, I think um, a major issue was also in building up student numbers in psychology. Um, I mean, I suppose many people 
read, coming to read psychology, um, if, if we applied directly as an undergraduate, came there because they wanted to be clinical psychologists or educational or what have you. And um, that inevitably meant uh, that um, the case for development in psychology, um, I think, lay in part in the growth in the psychologi psychological occupations. And I, I, I feel that... Um, so the BPS was perhaps doing a good role there, but because they were doing that, there wasn't a lot of room, perhaps. Uh, and it was not a suitable uh, place if you wanted to discuss scientific matters, really. Um, it's not that uh, you, you, you didn't, and uh, um, I, I certainly published what I regarded as one of my more interesting papers in uh, the British Journal at the time. So I, I just feel that these, there were these, uh, there was something there. Drew got sort of written out of uh, general history. And yet, if you consider coming forward uh, to, but well, the year I became I became president of the British Psychological, I, I was involved in the British Psychological Society um, as a, a librarian, and of course I I took over from Bert uh, in 1963. I think I became editor of the what was called the Journal of Statistical, and I made it the Journal of Mathematical and Statistical, and also set up a section of the society. Because uh, remember that the society had various sections, um, but there wasn't one then which represented any, any um, thing like the experimental psychologists. I don't think that came until uh, late 1970s, I think, when uh, um, uh, a um, cog cognitive psychology section was formed I, I think uh, though of course Broadbent it, it's interesting that um, Sangwell didn't become president until quite late after me perhaps um, I, I'm thinking of the BPS um, but Broadbent I'm not quite sure must have been sometime in, in the 60s or so so I think Broadbent was working much harder uh, on trying to keep uh, uh, the British Psychological Society and the various professional groups um, in, in, in sort of contact with the EPS. Um, so, um, but I, I, I think it was, it was perhaps more amongst many of the younger members than it was in the overall contact between EPS and, and, and BPS that the trouble uh, may have existed in people's minds as much as anything um, and unnecessarily um, but I, I I of course I found myself in well I, I don't know I was a bit I must have been a terrible idiot in um, 19. About 1961 onwards, um, because I was I was sort of doing everything, which didn't seem a very good idea. Well, I, I was having uh, children. Um, I had made a, I had made five television programs for schools on psychology. That was 1961, I think. Um, I, I have been invited to teach in Columbia in 1962. Um, I think I, I was editing the, editing the journal for, from, uh, from 63 to 63 to 68. Uh, I was librarian of the British Psychological Society at that period. Then I became secretary 
uh, of the EPS. Um, when was it? 63, something like that. Uh, a couple of years. Oh, and prior to that, in those days, I don't know if it still exists, this, this probably doesn't, but there were also assistant secretaries of the EPS. So uh, John Brown was secretary when I was assistant secretary. And that, that was a sort, sort of warming up period to becoming the secretary, really. And um, so I had all those things coming on. The special role of the society, in spite of these conflicts that, e that exist, and I haven't gone into it in, in great details, one of the things was that uh, uh, it moved around different it moved around different uh, departments, um, and it was meeting relatively frequently. I mean, uh, to meet in, uh, as it were, winter, spring, and summer, uh, for a scientific society is 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 going it a bit. Uh, they tend to be annual. Uh, also, um, uh, students could go to the meetings, uh, and uh, attend. Uh, and so uh, you were meeting all the people who were doing the research um, uh, and listening to them and being able to question them. Uh, and, of course, and also many people who are doing their PhDs, uh, are finishing their PhDs, then quite often their, their first publication might well be in the quarterly journal. Um, and so the, there was both the, the society ab ability to give papers of the society, because I talked about my PhD work in the society. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, also um, it led very much to spreading uh, the latest research um, out into um, other university departments because of the membership of being wide. Um, and so I, I, th I think it really had a, 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 a really powerful influence in spreading knowledge of, 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 of uh, psychology. And of course, the other thing was that it became a kind of focus um, uh, uh, for uh, overseas um, uh, specialist visitor psychologists. I mean, we at UC, we used to have uh, quite a lot of people c coming over for a year. Um, they might be people like, um, uh, well, when uh, Sternberg and Sperling were doing their early work, um, uh, they were there, and of course they... They pop up in uh, in the um, Bartlett lectures uh, as well. Uh, so there were these uh, visitors, right? and uh, um, Gordon Barr was another visitor to uh, uh, UC, and also uh, appearing at uh, the EP, uh, EPS or EPG. Um, the, the, I think. I mean, one point I wanted, uh, I should make, I think, is, is that um, my contacts in America and um, internationally were more in the mathematical. There was this little burst of mathematical psychology with uh, Busham, Stella, and Luce, and Barr, and Atkinson. And, uh, the, these were people I knew, and uh, these were people came over, and they also because mathematical psychology was hardly, only barely, it, it, it was just a burst of activity in which mathematical models were being applied to psychological problems, but they were uh, more or less acceptable inside the general experimental psychology realm. And, and, and many people, like Sternberg and so on, or Bauer, they were experimental psychologists. And so that was another extra link-up um, which made... The EPS, I think, um, are quite important in relation to international relations, and of course, it, in relation to uh, uh, to Europe, that gradually came in. 
and um, the the relative um, uh, willingness to have uh, specialists from other fields come into the meetings. I mean, this, this and this led to all kinds of possible uh, links, developments, uh, strengthening certain branches, uh, which I, I think was really, um, really quite I I important. I mean, I'm thinking at Cambridge, uh, there were a statistician, like uh, there was Violet Kane, who was a statistician there, but she was working with Margaret Vince on certain tracking problems and so on. And they, they also did papers on, um, I remember on the hatching of eggs, uh, how they hatch, uh, as it were, more together than you would expect on a model where they just hatched at random intervals, uh, things like that. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's rather amusing to me, Violet Kane, uh, uh, and after her there was Mervyn Stone, who was a statistician, but got involved in developing models of choice, which Lamming took up uh, later. Um, but, uh, you know, on, on these odd contacts, I just remember that uh, I had some communication with a postgraduate student of Violet Keynes. He was a, a Guyanan called uh, Ewart Thomas. And um, uh, he, he was working on general probability issues. And he got his PhD. And uh, I met him one day and asked him what he was doing. He didn't... Uh, he didn't um, have a, a particular job at that moment. So I said, well, you know, I've, I've got this research fellowship here, which um, uh, might suit you if you want it, but please, you know, only if you're not going to get an, another job, because I'm not trying to turn you into a psychologist. Anyway, he, so he took it. And, um, and it's rather funny, because later on... Um, uh, uh, David Cox, who was a, a very uh, distinguished uh, statistician at Imperial College, asked me, I mean, how, how, how did you come to uh, uh, manage to get uh, you at Thomas working for you? I said, I offered him a job. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't do it. Anyway, you it was, it was a pretty bright chap. and uh, But I, I, I was offered a job somewhere, uh, another job, uh, 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 to go to some American uh, session. Uh, some kind of, of conference or other. And I couldn't go, but I said that they should ask you, because he'd been better than me. So he went there, and after that, I don't know, he got offered a job at MIT, and he ended up, he became the head of Stanford Psychology Department. <laughs> And then he became the Dean of Social Sciences there. Well, there's these strange uh, contacts. And I feel, in a way, that, that is an illustration of the kind of random connections which, uh, in a way, the society was responsible for. And it should be remembered that uh, from quite an early stage, uh, there was there were, there were this animal research input in um, that... Um, that, um, uh, well, of course, later led to the division of having two separate journals coming out, the section A and section B at some point. And uh, I thought that was rather good. The other, the other thing to mention, uh, I won't go into too much detail, is that there was a very difficult period in psychology, I think, at the end of the... 50s, just about the time that I was graduating. I was very lucky because James, my uh, my tutor as an undergraduate, um, uh, he moved, he decided to leave Britain in 57. He went to Dalhousie University, I think. And 
there, there, uh, there was quite a feeling amongst academic staff at that time everywhere that there were not, there was nowhere for them to go. Um, and so many people uh, left. Um, Hurwitz, who was an animal psychologist uh, at Birkbeck, in, in fact, Hurwitz is the reason that um, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, who has the back page of the Times Higher Education Supplement? Taylor, Taylor, something Taylor. It's gone out of my mind. But anyway, he he is sociologist. He became a, he was a psychologist and became a sociologist. But he's always made fun of experimental psych of, of of animal psychology. And you'll find his re remarks about it more or less every week, I suppose. But that was because of research being done in animals. Uh, and he, he continued to identify psychology with um, uh, uh, the, the, the bar pressing uh, fraternity. But he, he was unhappy and went. And then there were... Uh, 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 quite a, a number of people in the EPS who were significant. So Tony Deutsch, uh, who, who was amongst others in uh, sort of stimulating almost uh, the uh, the later cognitive approach to reinforcement that Macintosh and others were developing, and uh, and then there was Dodwell, who was a perception chap quite a lot of interesting work, and he went off uh, to join James, I think, in Dalhousie. And so there was a real brain drain at that time. Now, I, in a way, I was lucky, I suppose, because I just came up to at a point, because James went, I came in at that time and could stay on. And what happened in the society, of course, was that... Uh, um, when a new generation of people became had chairs, uh, they, in many cases, I mean, there was Roy Davis, who went to Reading, and there was Ian Half, who went to Nottingham. Uh, myself, of course, I was, uh, about the time they got their chairs, I was made a chair. Uh, so, in, in the mid-60s, there was a revival, and... Uh, I'm sure the e EPS had provided a basic pool of people who had an, enough knowledge and experience to uh, take up those things. I think those those are things which come to mind mind as quite significant, really. Mm. I was wondering if you had any advice um, to give the younger listeners uh, if someone's starting out uh, with a career in psychology. Um, perhaps you have some advice. And also, what have you found to be really good about being a psychologist? And what have you found really bad about being a psychologist? I, I just say that, that, that basically the subject itself uh, is a tremendous introduction uh, to many fields of science. Now, during the time I was there, um, uh, genetic aspects, of course, could only be explored really via uh, the uh, uh, kinds of uh, behavioural genetics approach, which, in my view, not to be sniffed at, I think, uh, you know, quite a lot of valuable work. Um, there were some mavericks around, but by and large... Uh, uh, of course, now, with uh, uh, genetics coming up, and uh, I, I'd hope to see more developments in that field coming up. I, I mean, there is dairy at... Um, at um, Edinburgh, isn't there? But uh, um, no, hopefully there'll be more in that way. The, the other thing is, it does uh, it does introduce one to uh, how to carry out experiments, sorry, uh, and uh, how to analyse them, and uh, the very fact that uh, there are individual differences. Um, how, how to cope with individual differences in trying to study general processes. I think that's, um, you know, that's something that not many other disciplines have to tackle. Um, um, and 
the other point, as to me, psychology remains uh, the only subject in, I think, I may be talking rubbish, I don't, I don't think so, um, that uh, offers um, an analysis with a focus on the individual organism and uh, views it from so many different directions, you know, from the developmental, the social, the genetic, and so on. And that seems to me very important. That's why I'm uh, very old-fashioned in feeling that one ought to have psychologists around, you know. And I, I have been critical of um, having all these uh, new things with neuroscientists and cognitive neuroscientists and um, brain sciences and, and so on. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm quite willing to have them around, but I would like them to hang on to psychology. And I, 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 I wonder I, I, if, if there was someone like me now, sort of drifting towards discovering, wh where would I go? I mean, would I apply to university? Would I say, oh, I want a degree in neuroscience? And then you might get captured by anatomists or something like that. And that uh, worries me. And of course, I, I've always, it, it's very, in a way, the name of the society, Experimental Psychology Society, is itself a bit odd, I think. But uh, uh, now it doesn't matter because uh, things are more or less operationally defined, aren't they? I mean, experimental psychology is whatever the Experimental Psychology Society is doing. And when I was at the uh, Oxford meeting, um, to cut the cake uh, last year. Um, um, I was struck by the many sections, and they did more begin to represent the breadth of psychology today. But there are still some kind of... Maybe it's a good thing, because, I mean, after all, psychology breaks down into all its different tribal groups, and it's inevitable, but... I, I'm drifting away from psychology at the moment, but just to say about the society. I mean, one of the joys of um, being at an EPS meeting as a student was that you um, uh, got to hear about all kinds of subjects in psychology which you didn't know about. And the psychologists were lucky to have people from other disciplines. You know, there were anatomists, and there were people from other significant groups, like the uh, Farnborough uh, people who were doing um, uh, air, um, air flying personnel uh, problems, things like that. The, the more coming in was really, uh, I think, of, um, of tremendous uh, value. One other thing, going back to just this parenthesis to the business about uh, experimental psychology and others. I mean, you do get funny situations turning up. But two things. One I was going to say about George Drew again is that, of course, he was the chap involved in turning the group into a society because he had the kind of general know-how uh, of handling things like that. And... Uh, in 1969, uh, when I was president of the British Psychological Society, it was George Drew who was appointed by the BPS to be the chairman of the international, uh, the British uh, uh, organisers of the International Congress of Psychology, which was held in London. And... Um, it, you see, it was the, the EPS was not involved in that. It's the BPS had that job, and uh, ironically, I suppose I, I was the president at the time, uh, but I was the co-chairman with Donald Broadbent of the program. 
committee. So it was, again, this, uh, those of us who were stuck in the middle with some of these other bigger society matters uh, felt that the EPF was rather getting away with it, you know. They could do, go on doing their experiments and getting all the scientific glory, and there was us slaves <laughs> making sure there were enough students, there were enough resources, uh, that psychology was growing, and things like that. So uh, that happened. By the way, I mean, you know, these are, it's interesting to see the funny things that happened in America, you know, because at the turn of a turn of the century, I mean, 1900 or thereabouts, uh, Titchener, uh, who was the doyen of Buntian psychology then, but he set up a a society of experimental psychologists. It, it was first of all just called uh, Society of Experimentalists, I think. And they were not, all they did was just to uh, meet up in, have a look at one another's labs and have a chat. And nothing terribly formal about it. Sometime later, I think, at the late twenties, they turned themselves into the Society of Experimental Psychology. Psychologists, I think. Um, but the thing is, that by then, it, 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 and then they were a bit more formal, and they had annual general meetings and so on. Uh, and I suppose the Journal of Experimental Psychology must have got underway about that time. But uh, it was it was much more elite than the uh, experimental psychology society has ever been. I mean, that's a, uh, I think quite an important thing to remember. It's not been an elite body. I mean, it may have had its elite members, but it, it's been fairly open. Uh, membership has not been particularly restrictive, provided you can give a uh, you give a, a decent and interesting paper, which other members will accept. Uh, you're you're in really well. I suppose it's still true, but it used to be true in my days. And whereas in in the American society, I think I, no, no more than about ten percent of experimental psychologists, uh, uh, people who would be called experimental psychologists, were would be in it. And this got so much, and then also they tended to be old boys, you know that, um, and that led. Uh, because I, I went to one of their meetings in, I don't know, it was in the mid-30s, um, a group set themselves up called the Society of Experimenting Psychologists. And uh, they, you couldn't, you had to be under 40, and you must attend every meeting. Um, uh, so that, and they, they, then, they then renamed themselves later on as the Round Table. And they never had more than about 30 members, and uh, you had to retire at the age of 40, and you couldn't be there. Uh, I, I didn't really take because I, I was invited to one meeting, I think, uh, when I was um, at Princeton, and um, uh, and it was interesting that amongst the people then, the, the Res Caller was the chairman, uh, who also was one of them giving a paper at the EPS, uh, Bartlett one, I think, and Sternberg there. Um, I was 42 at the time, but they didn't know that was all right. But, but again, there was, but they were not, they were just, in a way, they were just chatting and presenting things. You know. It was the, the experimental size. Psychology Society, it's a much more active body, I think. And uh, uh, I, I think John Mullen has made the remark that in the early days we were very uh, amateur, and that that is, uh, I think, certainly true. I mean, most of us who, like myself, were as a secretary, wouldn't be considered the very good secretary. I think um, John Mullen was much better. I think. Um, but uh, you know, and now the society is much more professional in its approach, and even in the uh, 
handling of the uh, 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 journal and so on. Well, Bob, thank you so much for your time. It's been really interesting to hear your experiences of the Experimental Psychology Society and to hear about your journey. So thanks again for your time and thank you so much for sharing your wonderful stories. Thank you.